Good morning. My name is LaShonda, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Infrastructure Management Global Community webcast. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. Thank you. I will now turn today's call over to Mr. Stuart Wingnick, Communications Officer for the Global IM Community. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, we're going to have a uh, short webcast today. Um, we're going to be covering, I'm going to be covering some of the application performance analysis, some of the stuff that we do through application delivery analysis, CA's uh, uh, super agent tool. Um, before we get started on that, I did want to mention um, we will be uh, at the end of this webcast redirecting you guys to a survey. We'd like your input on some, uh, some information there, so please take that survey. It shouldn't take too long. Um, and uh, we will be resuming, uh, continuing, I guess, with our normal webcast schedule starting in January. We do have a lot of webcasts lined up for the first part of the next year. Um, more webcasts but shorter content so that we can hopefully uh, get some better content out to you guys, stuff that you can uh, uh, digest pretty quickly and be able to start using. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm the communications officer at the NetQS community, or the uh, IM community. I come from NetQS. I have a history with NetQS uh, going back years and years. Um, and uh, so I've done services on multiple different companies and uh, I've been on the customer side, the consultant side. I've been on the, the, the corporate side with uh, CA, not with CA, but uh, back when it was just NetQS. Um, so I've got a lot of experience doing this. And so one of the very useful pieces of information or presentation pieces that I give is what I call my, my magic slide or the balance diagram. Uh, so we're going to go into that a little bit, and then I'm going to show you. Uh, uh, I've got a post on my blog where I go into this in a lot of detail. You can see the address there. Uh, but I've got a, a post on there where I go into detail about the application flow diagram, which is a key piece of information um, that I use in order to configure, to gather all the information I need to configure an application in, in application delivery analysis, ADA. By the way, if I slip up and call it super agent, that's just because it was that way for a long time. It's now got a new name. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, super agent or ADA captures its data via a capture point that's usually inside your data center watching packets as they come into and out of your server. So for example, we have a user that's out here across the infrastructure. Uh, he will be communicating with a server in our data center. The last point before it that those packets enter the server uh, is where we have our capture point set up. So that collector is going to be receiving a copy of all of that data and analyzing it. And one of the important things that, that ADA does is it helps us determine whether or not something is slowing down, in other words, slower than usual, and if that slowdown is happening, in this case, on the left-hand side or the right-hand side of our capture point, right? And by placing our capture point in the right place, um, we can ensure that the right-hand side is really only affected by server performance, and the left-hand side is really only affected by network performance, right? So what we want to do is we want to get our capture point as close to the server as possible, because that's going to ensure that when SuperAgent says or when ADA says that the problem is on the server side of the capture point, that that is only going to, going to indicate a problem with our server infrastructure. And when the collector says the problem is on the left-hand side of the capture point, that that's only going to indicate a problem with our, our network infrastructure. Okay, so let's, let's look at a typical TCP transaction. Um, in case you didn't know, SuperAgent only monitors TCP transactions. So let's look at a typical web transaction. The first thing that's going to happen in that transaction is a three-way handshake. Although the synchronized the SYNAC and the ACK come into the server, the, the server sends the SYNAC and the, the user sends back the acknowledgement. Once that's set up, it, theoretically, uh, both the server and the user can start sending data requests to each other. In a web transaction, the user is going to send his first request, which is going to be some kind of HTTP GET. Once that request comes into the server, the server is going to think about it for a, an amount of time. 
uh, and then it's going to start sending the data down to the NIC, and the NIC is going to then send that data out to the user. So he sends the, usually that data is going to be broken into pieces. That data is going to be sent out to the user. The user acknowledges the next piece of data comes out from the server, and the user acknowledges that. So at this point, in this simplified example, we can say that the user has all of index.html. Well, we all know that there is no web page out there that is only a single HTML file. There's other pieces. So there may be like a sub HTML page or a CSS or a JavaScript or some GIFs or PNGs that we may need to get. So in this case, let's say the user makes a second request for nav.html. Again, the server is going to go think about it for a second. And that same time may include going to other servers and getting other pieces of data. Maybe an application server uh, will, it, it'll, the web server will request information from the application server, and that application server may in turn request information from the database server. And really, your web transaction is not going to continue until those back-end pieces of processing finish. So once that back-end processing finishes and the server is ready to start sending out the data, it will go ahead and send it out. But let's say our network has some kind of problem. Uh, in this case, the packet gets lost. Well, what actually happens whenever any uh, IP endpoint sends out a packet, um, it will start a retransmit timer. And the idea behind that timer is whenever that timer gets down to zero, if it gets down to zero before there's a response from the other end, and the sender can assume that the packet did not arrive at its destination. There was some kind of packet loss. Um, so once that timer gets down to zero, then the server, in this case, is going to assume there was there was packet that didn't get to the user, so I'm going to retransmit. Again, another retransmit timer starts. In this case, we still had some kind of problem, so you can see that that retransmit timer got down to zero, and the data was sent out again. And then an acknowledgment finally comes back from the user, and then the conversation continues as normal, okay? Um, at this point, I want to go ahead and pause. Uh, if, if anybody does have any questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A in the WebEx, uh, or uh, like the operator said, you can hit the numbers to go ahead and ask your question there. Go ahead and ask your questions. We've got people monitoring the Q&A in the WebEx, and they can, they can pause me if, if I need to answer a question before moving on. So now that we've got this kind of framework, and, and pretty much all TCP transactions happen pretty closely to the way this, this, this transaction happened, we can now start to apply some analytics to kind of discover exactly what's going on here. The first thing that we should look at is how long it takes the server to set up a session. Setting up a session is the simplest thing that a server can do. So uh, by looking at how long it takes between when the synchronized packet comes into the server and the SYNAC goes out, that tells us how long it takes the server to set up the session. So we're not actually on the server. We can't see when the synchronized packet actually comes into the server, but we can see when that synchronized packet passes our collection point. So if we actually measure the delta between when the synchronized packet passes our collection point going into the server and when the SYNAC passes our collection point going back out to the client, we can get a fairly good idea of what our session setup time is, what's called server connection setup time. And in most cases, what we do is we assume that the amount of time between our collection point and getting to the server is either negligible or it's constant, right? You're not going to have a whole lot of different changing routes inside your data center and different kind of network dynamic things happening inside your data center between our capture point and the server, especially if your capture point is the switch where the server is, is connected, right? So we assume that's either zero or uh, – uh, not dynamic, it's, it's, it's a constant, uh, and so we can, can measure that server connection setup time. The next piece we measure is the network connection setup time, which is the other side of that TCP handshake. This is, again, the simplest possible thing that our WAN can do. Whether or not you've got steel heads, whether or not you've got acceleration, whether or not uh, you've got any kind of fancy technologies inside your WAN, the SYNAC and the ACK packet are always going to have zero payload, and it, in the case of uh, WAN accelerations like a riverbed or a Cisco WAS, they're not going to interfere with that TCP handshake, right? That still happens just like normal. So if we measure the amount of time between it when our Synax packet goes out to the client and then the client turns around and sends that, our acknowledgement back, we can get an idea of how well our network is handling that easiest possible 
transaction of data or transmission of data, okay? Once we've got the handshake done, we can actually go in and look at this, the, the transaction itself. Now, what we're looking at here is what you may consider one single transaction, getting the index.html and nav.html is what's required to display one page. And in all actuality, it probably even requires more than that. There's going to be GIFs and JPEGs and style sheets and, and JavaScript files and all that kind of stuff that's going to all come in. Uh, and all of those are going to be separate requests. Separate request, separate response from the server. Um, and so in SuperAgent or in, in ADA, what we call each one of those requests is a separate transaction, right? Um, so when you hear people talking about ADA and, and applications um, in ADA and transactions inside ADA, we're not really talking about the larger transaction of what it takes to load that single web page. We're talking about the single transaction of what does it take to request this one piece of resource and get that one piece of, of resource back from the server. So in this case, we've got two transactions. We've got index.html and nav.html. So uh, for each of these transactions, these individual transactions, we can measure how well our server is performing. And the easiest way to do that is by looking at our server response time. Server response time is measured by taking the delta between when our request comes into the server and the first piece of response comes back out of the server because we know that's our server think time. Now that server think time is going to depend on several things, your CPU, your memory, your input output speeds on your server itself, your buses, your motherboards, your uh, network card on your, on your server. All of that is part of your server think time. Plus you're also going to have your uh, back-end processing, right? Um, the server is not going to be able to send re data response A1 until it has all the data from the application server and the database server that it needs in order to compose data A1 or the response, right, response A. So once we see that packet, that first piece of the response coming back out from the server, then we know we have our server response time. Uh, and in this case, we actually have two measurements of server response time because we have two requests and two responses two transactions, therefore two response times. Our network round trip time is measured similarly, except that we take the other side of the transaction. And in this case, we actually measure the amount of time between when a packet goes out and the corresponding acknowledgement comes back. Now, I've oversimplified this. We have uh, a single acknowledgement for each data going out, but in a real life scenario, you're going to have multiple pieces of data coming out and multiple acknowledgements coming back and they may not line up one to one. The cool thing is that ADA actually knows when an acknowledgement comes back acknowledging, acknowledging multiple pieces of data. So those multiple pieces of data may be acknowledged, but we still get a good accurate measurement of the network round trip time. Now this network round trip time is different than the network connection setup time that happened in the TCP handshake because this network round trip time is going to feel the effect of any WAN optimizers that you have, it's going to feel the effect of the, the long distances that you have, uh, route changes, uh, any kind of bottlenecks that you may have on your network because these, these packets have payload. So these packets have payload, They're, they are your normal traffic that's going to be affected by all your wonderful technologies that are trying to make your network faster. So this network run trip time can give us a good indication of how well your network, with all of its bells and whistles, is handling your traffic, right? How quickly it can get that data across. Another metric that we look at is called the retransmission delay. Retransmission delay is the amount of time wasted because the server was waiting for a response that never came, okay? And in this case, we don't have any retransmission delay in the first transaction because there was no packet lost. Uh, and so the server wasn't waiting for an acknowledgement that didn't come because they all came. However, in the second transaction, we had two packets that went out. Both of them were lost, and therefore the server spent time waiting for that retransmit timer to get down to zero. The server was just waiting for that timer to get down to zero. The client was waiting for packets to come from the server. So everybody, the client and the server, were waiting on the network to transmit the packets, but the network lost those packets, so it's, it's not going to happen. So this retransmission delay is a measure of, of how much time the network, uh, how much delay the network causes when it loses packets. We simply measure that between uh, any time there was a countdown timer that actually got to zero. 
So we looked at any time there was a packet lost, uh, all the way down to when that pack, the successful packet was finally sent. Then we look at data transfer time. Data transfer time is the amount of time it actually takes to send the whole response. In this case, in both cases, we had two packets per response, right? Index.html was two packets, and nav.html was also two packets. So how long does it take to send those two packets? Well, that's what data transfer time tells us. It tells us how long between when the first packet goes out of the response and the last packet of that response. All right, and then one more metric that we kind of derive is the sum of server response time, network run trip time, retransmission delay, and data transfer time, and we call that total transaction time. And a lot of people sometimes get this confused with the amount of time it takes to load the web page. Well, that's not right. It's the amount of time for each individual transaction. And the idea is if you keep track of the individual transactions, then the larger transactions will keep themselves in check. You you think about finances. If you take care of your pennies, your dollars will take care of themselves. Okay. Um, at this point, I uh, wanted to check. Uh, operator, could you poll to see if there are any questions? At this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. And there are no audio questions at this time. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and move on. So the only other thing I wanted to show is how this has changed when you have something like a WAN accelerator in your network. Um, because when you have a WAN accelerator, the TCP transaction is actually broken up. And let me show you how that actually works. For the same web transaction, given a WAN accelerator at the, at the branch or the office site, and then a, and a WAN accelerator at the data center. Um, what happens is, uh, especially with Cisco WAS, you can actually tell the, uh, the flow agent on those Cisco WAS boxes to send their data into SuperAgent, which is cool. It gives you two extra collection points. But for the regular transaction, that same web transaction, the synchronized request, the SYNAC, and the ACK, that TCP handshake, remains unchanged. It's unaffected by uh, by those WAN accelerators, and it has to be, otherwise it would break TCP. The next thing that happens is the user makes a request, and assuming there's no caching going on, um, the HTTP GET is going to come all the way through. The WAN accelerators start to do their work. They may cache that request so that when it comes in the next time, they don't have to transmit it across the WAN. Um, but that request comes into the server. Uh, server, again, we have sync time, but then he starts sending the data out. Now, here's where the difference is. When the data comes out to the server and it hits that data center uh, WAN accelerator, uh, the WAN accelerator is actually going to send the acknowledgement right away. Um, and so the server and the, and the WAN accelerator have a couple of, uh, couple of microseconds, a couple of cycles where it's going to be sending all of that data out. And the server thinks that the client is responding when it's really the WAN accelerator. But for, for the, from the server point of view, it's great because the server thinks, hey, I'm sending this data out. I'm getting acknowledgments really quickly, so let's go ahead and send out more and more data. The TCP window grows. You send out lots of data really quickly uh, because it's all happening locally, right? Then your WAN accelerator, once he has all of that data, he's going to send what they call a TFO. Uh, and I'm not, I don't recall what TFO stands for, but it's basically a big uh, amalgamation of all of that response going to send that over across the WAN. Now, it could be that if that response was cached on the other side, it could just be an instruction on the other side to spit out the cache. Um, if it's not cached, it could be the actual data. That data may be compressed uh, or otherwise optimized. Okay? The, uh, the WAN accelerator at the far end is going to send back his acknowledgment, and then on the far end, the WAN accelerator is going to send the data out to the user. The user and the WAN accelerator at the far end are both local. So they're going to have a real quick conversation getting that data out to the user. And that's really how the WAN accelerators get things to happen a lot more quickly than usual. Okay. The only problem is this kind of breaks how ADA looks at transactions, right? Specifically, the network round trip time. Because if, if we look at our normal super agent collector, which is down here, um, collecting from the same place, if we look at the network round trip time, those acknowledgments for the packets that are going out to who we think are the user, 
they're coming back almost immediately because the the WAN agent or the WAN accelerator engine locally in the data center is sending back those acknowledgments. So really, if if you don't have visibility into the WAN accelerator engines themselves, you don't get a good network run trip time because it all looks local or it all happens local, but it, it appears as if it's the user sending those responses. So you need visibility. So what ADA does is if you have Cisco WAS or if you have Riverbed ADA 9 dot something and, the, and newer uh, version 10, they all support uh, a Riverbed as well. So you can do collections on the data center WAN accelerator engine and on the, the remote office uh, WAN accelerator engine. And if you do that, then you can actually calculate a couple of metrics that are specific to optimized transactions. First of all is the client response time. And that's your overall amount of time between when the request left the user's NIC or the user's office, really, and when the response finally got out to the user, right? So it's your total transaction time. Helps you know how long it took to actually perform that transaction. And you can see if if, if there were information that were cached on the on the remote data the remote uh, site uh, accelerator then a lot of stuff in the middle here doesn't have to happen. If a lot of stuff in the middle doesn't have to happen, then everything happens a lot more quickly. So your client response time adjusts according to what's actually happening. The next thing we look at is, a, is our server response time. That's actually calculated the same way that always is, especially if you have your, your ADA collector right in the data center at that switch. However, if you don't have it in there, you can actually derive server server response time, and ADA does it automatically, but you can derive server response time from the data coming from the, the data center WAN accelerator engine, right? Um, and then the last one we look at is the network round trip time for the WAN, which is actually just comprising the long portion of your, your network round trip, which is from one WAN accelerator to the other and back, okay? So we'll go ahead and pause here for a moment, and uh, operator, if you could pull for questions. As a reminder to ask an audio question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Can everyone else hear me? And there are no audio questions at this time. Okay. Uh, Melissa, Melanie, are you guys still there? Can you hear me? Yep, yeah, we hear you fine. fine. I'm okay, responding just... and seeing um, whether it's the audio broadcast or the dial-in that's having problems. Yeah, okay, good. Stuart, so uh, you, you did get one question. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, how do you achieve this using riverbeds, and can you inter integrate riverbeds? So the question is, can you do this via riverbed as opposed to Cisco WAS? Yes. With Cisco WAS, it's, it's really easy because you don't need anything special. You go into the WAS, you enable the flow agent, and it sends the data directly to the collector, which is great. If you have a riverbed, what you have to do is you have to put a or you have to put a collector getting a span of the data going into and out of the riverbed uh, at, at each point. So for example, um, instead of having just one collector here, what you would have is you would have one collector here with a flow agent data center and one collector here at the flow agent at the branch. So one at the data center, uh, riverbed and one at the, the branch riverbed. And at the branch riverbed, all you need is a copy of the traffic on the LAN side, right? So the client side of that riverbed is all you need a copy of because we just need to be able to see what's what's coming in and going out from the client perspective. At the data center, you have to set up your collector as a multi-NIC collector, which is something easy to do with CA. Um, and one of your NICs needs to capture from the the data center side where your servers are, where you can see these data response A1, ACK response A1, data response A2, A3, and so forth. Um, and you also set the other NIC to capture the, the tunnel traffic, if you will, between the, the riverbeds, this, this green traffic that I've highlighted here. And what happens is the, the, the ADA collector receives both of those feeds and you set up the NIC, there's a special configuration in the collector. You say this is receiving from the data center side of the data center river, riverbed. This is receiving from the data center riverbed on the WAN side. And that way the collector knows what to expect and what to look for 
uh, and then it starts pulling out these corresponding metrics. You don't actually have to configure anything special in the application to tell it that it's using LAN acceleration. That's all configured on the collector itself. All right, so let me look here. And we do have an audio question from the line of Anchor Aurora. Okay, go ahead. Uh, hi. Uh, so the Cisco setup, how many super agent collectors do we need to make this work? Um, that's a good question. The number has been going up uh, almost exponentially since they released the feature. Um, I've I've done it with uh, one one WAS in the data center and uh, I think nine or ten remote WASs uh, with a standalone uh, ADA, so only one collector. Um, but that's probably a question more for a CA. We can probably get that answer for you. I would suggest posting that kind of question in the community. Uh, the product manager, Martin Koleski, does uh, watch those, and he can answer that specifically for you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we did have a question. If you have LAN set up with Riverbed and SA on WAN, how would you integrate it and get the most out of both? Okay, so if you have LAN set up with Riverbed and SuperAgent on the WAN, I'm, I'm, uh, Daxish, I'm, I'm going to need some clarification on that. Oh, Dan Bosk is on the line. Cool. Um, okay, so I'm I'm not really sure what your what your question is, Daxish. Um, if, if you could please clarify a little bit. Um, if if you have yes, you can get riverbed data into SuperAgent or ADA. All you need to do is span the data into the collector, right? With Cisco WAS, you you go to the WAS box and you turn on what's called the flow agent, and it sends a special type of net flow into the master console. With Riverbed, you just span the traffic into a collector just like any other collector. And there are no audio questions at this time. Okay. Sure, we had a question come in the chat box as well. Uh, okay, let me look in the chat here real quick. How many collectors do you need for Cisco win? Uh, that was that was answered verbally. Uh, Sorry about that. Yeah, no, that's fine. It's uh, I, I don't know the specific number. Uh, you'd have to check the documentation, or easily you could easily post a post a question on the community. And like I said, Martin Koleski uh, looks at that. Ah, uh, can you forward the data from Riverbed to SA? So. Uh, if, if you're talking about using Riverbed's application analysis engine in Riverbed and then somehow tie that data into SuperAgent, no, that integration, as far as I know, doesn't exist. The only way to do it is to actually get a copy of the packets from your Riverbed going into and out of your Riverbed into the collector, um, the, the ADA collector, right? Um, it's, the main reason for that is because they are competing products. Uh, Riverbed has their own monitoring tool that does the, the Riverbed monitoring. Um, ADA can do the same thing, just it's not it's not in bed Riverbed. We're not inside Riverbed. We get the data from outside Riverbed. We get it off the wire. Right, right. So with with ADA, we sit inside this stream right here. The the from the data center. Uh, riverbed to the the remote riverbed, we sit inside and we get a copy of the packets inside this stream between the two, uh, and then we decode that. It's really not actually very hard to decode that that traffic, uh, and then that tells us information about what packets are going back and forth and and uh, and what what servers are involved, what clients are involved. <laughs> yes, Dan says it's super hard, but yes, we are just good at it. I, I I differ. I don't think it's actually quite that hard. <laughs> okay, so uh, it doesn't look like we have any other questions on the chat or the Q&A, so I'm going to go ahead and continue on. Um, so just as a review, uh, looking at uh, response time and, and how it's composed, 
This is a graph that you will see all over ADA and the GUI. This is a response time composition. This is where we actually put our four core metrics together and look at them. So first, remember our server response time, amount of time it takes the server to begin responding to that request. Uh, and this is the same with or without Riverbed. Because Riverbed is a networking technology, it does not affect how quickly your server actually responds to requests. Um, so the cool part about this is it doesn't matter. Uh, but the server response time does give you a good indication of how well your server is performing. Um, over a large number of transactions, you're really going to have the same kinds of transa transactions happening all the time. Um, and so you can look at that and, and analyze how that's going on. For example, in this picture, you can see that all of a sudden at 7 a.m., our server response time jumped from somewhere around 1.25, 1.5 seconds up to almost four seconds, right? So just by looking at that, we can see that, hey, something is going on on our server. Data transfer time, the amount of time it takes the server to send the requested data. Uh, in this picture, you can see that actually the data transfer time does increase from what it was at, and then at 7 o'clock, it increases to a larger amount. That's likely due to the server uh, taking longer to respond to requests. If the server's taking longer to respond to requests, then it's also going to have a hard time sending that data out, right? Retransmission time or delay, because the network dropped a packet, the client was waiting, the server was waiting, it's all that wasted time. And then network round trip time is the amount of time it takes to get across the network and back uh, in both directions. We add all of those up and we get the total transaction time for a single for a single transaction. Okay. Um, I did want to talk about the granularity and multi-port collector. If you haven't been sold on multi-port collector, you should be, at least be thinking about it uh, because there are some major advantages to it. Uh, one advantage is that by default, without a multi-port collector, when you're looking at the data, you actually see the summarization of each five minutes of data by user and server combination. Okay, so if I have two users that are at two different offices and they connect into the same server, if I look at one of those users, I can see what his average network round trip time is or what his average server response time is, but I can't look at the different requests that he may have made. I can't look at the server response time for one request versus the other. Also, this is all summarized over every five minutes. Um, with multi-port collector, what you actually get is a breakdown per session. Um, most of you know that if you open a browser and you go to web, a web page, most of the time it's going to kick off five different sessions to pull down all the different resources, right? It'll kick off one session to get the initial, the initial HTTP get, and then it kicks off, you know, between five or ten sessions, depending on the, the browser, uh, so that it can pull down all those different pieces of data. So the nice part about that is we can actually, with Multiport Collector, break that out and show you, well, in this session where he requested this kind of data, it took this long, and whereas this other session he requested this other kind of data and it only took this long. That tells us, gives us an indication of, well, the amount of time it took was actually because of the type of data he was requesting, not anything to do with the server. It helps us narrow it down to exactly what was going on. The other advantage with multi-port collectors, we get one-minute resolution data. As opposed to a summary of an entire five-minute period saying all the transactions during this five minutes, the server response time was X, we can actually say within this five-minute period, the first three minutes were fairly quick, and then all of a sudden it got really slow uh, during the third minute, and then the fourth and fifth minutes were really, really fast. So we can actually break that down with the higher resolution data and the, uh, the session level data in, in multi-port collector. So with that, I did want to go ahead and bring up, um, <clears throat> I can get it open here, bring up my uh, blog, because I did want to show, <clears throat> if you get to my blog, you can just uh, search for, as soon as the search comes up, you can search for application delivery analysis, or you can search for, I think application should work. Clearly, Google needs SuperAsian to help them make this faster. Okay, so uh, you'll find the post that says manually configuring applications in SuperAsian, which is basically what I've been talking about here. You'll find a recording of this, so if you ever want to go back and look at this, this is another recording of almost the same data that I presented today. And then I talked about the application flow diagram. 
Now, the application flow diagram, let me go ahead and open this up. The application flow diagram is what I use to collect information from the application owners uh, so that I can see the, the information that I need in order to configure the, the data in SuperAgent. So let me go ahead and, and zoom in here a little bit. So this is a business application. XYZ Corporation has an application called Orion. And uh, in, in this application, there are multiple level, levels. There's web applications. There's a load balancer. There's virtual servers. There's physical servers. There's database servers all over the place. Let me turn off a layer here. Uh, and let's just look at what's really going on. So we've got our user up here, and he connects into the, uh, the load balancer. This is maybe an F5 load balancer. And uh, this F5 load balancer receives all those requests and load balances between two physical, or sorry, in this case, virtual servers, all both on port 80, where our, our, our load balancer is doing our, our SSL offload. And then those, those web servers have app, an application server that they connect into. Depending on what they need to do, they connect into different ports, right? And each, each one of these three different ports maybe hosts a different part of a web service or a different uh, kind of application service. And then that, that application ser server actually connects back into a physical database server, um, which may have, uh, you know, a control port and maybe some data ports, okay? This application flow diagram template that I've set up actually should have most every possible scenario that you can see. Um, so what we do is we look at how we can actually uh, uh, annotate or build the applications in here. So I'm going to turn on my application designations. So once I've collected the information, like IP addresses and port numbers, and I've drawn them out in this diagram, which, by the way, I normally draw this out on a whiteboard with the application owner sitting right there. I draw it out. I pull the information out. I say, where does this connect in? What port is it on? What's the IP address? I get all that information first. Then I build this diagram and, and obviously check with them and make sure I got it right. But then it's really easy to just go in and draw circles and say, you know what, this is one application, this is another application, this is another application, and I can show how these all play together. So in this case, where we have the user connecting into a load balancer on port 443, I would designate that as the application tier one, and then I have a naming standard, right? I would obviously call it Orion because that's the name of this overall application. Then I put tier one. Uh, because this is the first tier, the first place where users connect in. This is also the place where if I measure the user response here, I can actually get a good idea of what kind of user response the end user is getting. And then I call it Secure Web, which is this portion of the, of the application. Um, the beginning and end ports of 443, and the server assigned is going to be this 10.20.30.55, right, the orion.xyz.com. Then I move on to application tier two, which actually has two servers in it, both hosting in kind of a load balanced or, or server farm. Uh, so that's where I go in and I, I call that Orion tier two web farm. And uh, when I specify that in SuperAgent, I can either specify this as a, as a web farm with individual servers or a web farm as a cluster of servers so that if I lose one, I can still consider the application available. Or I can actually specify, hey, if I lose 1 out of 20, that's not a big problem. But if I lose 10 out of 20, that's a big problem. So you can go in and you can configure that separately. Down here on the, on the third tier, I actually have three different application ports going on. Maybe one is for orders and another is for something else and another is for something else. Um, uh, processing, processing, it looks like I called all three processing. Um, so three different processing services here, uh, Orion Tier 3 processing, 14235, 16235, and 15235, okay? And then down here on the database, I actually created a range, right? I said port begin is 5,000 and port end is 6,000. Call that Tier 4 database data, and this is Tier 4 database control, which is the port 139. And that's all going to be specific to your actual database if you have some uh, you know, if it's MySQL, it's going to be 3306. If you have uh, Oracle, it's going to be uh, 1421, or maybe that's SQL, I can't remember. But anyway, so you, you gather all this data, you build out this drawing, and then it's really easy for you to just go in and draw circles and say, you know what, that's my application designation right there. This is one piece of my application. This is another piece. And then once you have this all built in SuperAgent, you can actually start troubleshooting it 
from top to bottom. You can look here at the tier one and say, you know, what is my total transaction time and is it deviating from normal? And if it is, then I can go in and I can look at that and I can say, you know what, it's deviating from normal, let's figure out why. Is it because of my network time, which is going to be from here out to the end user, or is it because of server sync time, which could be something inside my server here, or it could be back-end processing. Well, when you get into back-end processing, you start going a little bit farther into the rabbit hole. You look at this and find out, well, is the problem here or is it somewhere down below? And that's going to be all your server think time. Is your server think time because of CPU, memory, input, output resources? That's where you need to start combining this data with your SNMP performance data, looking at your CPU utilization, your memory utilization. Um, so all of this uh, information is available on my, on my blog, stuart.weenig.com. Uh, like I said, you can just search for application. That usually is the first uh, result there. Um, I'll also post this as a link uh, along with our replay and, and the Q&A transcript uh, up, on, up on the community after this is all done. So at this point, uh, I'm going to check the Q&A. Operator, if you wouldn't mind checking uh, the uh, polling for questions, please. Again, to ask a question, press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. At this time, there are no questions. Okay, so I'm not seeing any more questions in the Q&A. Let me check the chat. Doesn't look like there are any more there. Are there any other questions? Feel free to post it in the Q&A or, or in the chat. Because if not, then I'm going to go ahead and, and call this done. Um, like I said, after we finish this uh, and you close the WebEx, you're going to be redirected to a survey. Please fill out that survey. Uh, if you have any questions that you think of right after we, we hang up, please feel free to either comment on my blog or on the community. Community is probably the best place because that way you can actually get uh, more than my own expertise. Um, I know there are several really good guys over at CA that keep an eye on that kind of stuff, so they, they can help answer those questions as well. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions, so we're going to go ahead and call this a day. Uh, appreciate everybody coming, and I um, uh, hope everybody has a good holiday, and uh, we'll see you guys next year. Thank you, Stuart. No this problem. concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect.